school out. <laughs> I'm glad you can come today. This July the 10th. I'll tell you, summer is come and it is getting hotter, isn't it? I'm glad that. I wish the Lord had sent us some rain. Amen. Amen. We need some rain. This morning, I want to speak to you on the subject of a great believer, Paul. Paul really believed God. He banked his whole life on the Lord. He really believed that God was in control and that God was going to direct his life. I want to read you verses from chapter 27 in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 27. And I want to read verses uh, 23 through 25. We're going to talk about the experience of the Apostle Paul this morning, and, and then we're going to talk about how he believed God and what the end result was for him. In Acts chapter 25, verse 23, Paul says, For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, and it shall be even as it was told to me. Paul is on a ship, and he's sailing toward Rome. He has a court date with Caesar. It, it, the end result of Paul's court date with Caesar was... He was had his head chopped off and was killed. But uh, we need not fear about that experience because Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. He said in another place, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he said in another place, I have a desire to depart and be with the Lord. Paul wanted to go and be with Jesus. Now, I want you just to look at verse 25 when he says, Wherefore, sirs, he's talking to a bunch of people on a ship. They're in the midst of a great hurricane, a storm has engulfed the ship. The ship is going to be broken up. It's going to sink. And Paul says in the face of it all, be of good cheer. You remember when Jesus came walking on the water to the disciples and the storm had blown up and Jesus said, Peace be still, and the storm cease. And he said, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. That means don't let the situation that you're in get you down. Just be happy that God is going to see you through. Every one of us need that assurance in our hearts today. We can be of good cheer because this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And so, here's one of the most gripping stories in the whole New Testament. It's hard to find a story anywhere in the Bible that is greater than this one or even equal to it. When you read about Paul's experience, you can start back at Acts chapter 25 and read all the way down to the end of the book of Acts. And it is a marvelous story of 
faith and what faith does for our lives. Let me tell you folks, faith is something mighty. It is powerful and wonderful. And what a benefactor we are that we get the benefits of faith. Luke tells this story. He's the one who wrote the book of Acts. And uh, he gives a thrilling description of Paul's faith and what the result of it was. Now, the story that I want to talk about this morning opens, and it is a small group of people, four people in fact, that have met on the deck of a ship. It, the ship is anchored in a port called Fair Haven, and uh, it is just on the Isle of Crete. So, it's over there in that area. And these four men are having a conference. The first one that I mentioned to you is named in the 26th chapter and the 27th chapter of the book of Acts. Is a Roman officer. He's in the Roman army. His name is Julius. He is a courageous man who has proved himself in battle and he represents the mighty power of the Roman government. So Julius is in this conference. And then there's another guy there. We don't have his name, but he is the owner of the ship. The ship is anchored in the Fair Havens harbor and uh, the, sh the ship owner is there and as the ship owner he also owns the cargo that's on the ship. Uh, the man who owns the ship owned the cargo and then he was responsible for the delivery of it and so this guy is a money man. He has a lot of wealth and he is in on this conference. What they're trying to decide are they going to anchor the ship at Fair Havens and wait out the winter, or are they going to sail on to a better place because they know that winter is coming and the storms out on the ocean are very great. So they're trying to make a decision about what they're going to do, whether they're going to sail or whether they're going to stay anchored in the port. There's another man in the conference, and he's the captain of the ship. And, uh, of course, he's going to have something to say as to whether they're going to sail or whether they're going to stay put. And there's another man in the conference. He's an itinerant gospel preacher. You wonder what Paul's doing in the meeting with those three men until you realize Paul has a message from God. He's been praying about this, and you'll notice that when I started reading, the Apostle Paul says that uh, I, there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord, and he says, you know, I belong to the Lord, and I serve the Lord. And he just introduces the fact that his God is in control of all of this. And uh, the Apostle Paul, he didn't have a lot of money, so he doesn't qualify with the owner of the ship. He doesn't have a lot of seafaring experience. He has some, but he's never been an officer in the Navy. So he doesn't qualify as the captain of the ship. And uh, he... Uh, He's not in the army, so he doesn't have any authority that's vested in him by Caesar. But he is a servant of the Most High God. And God has laid his hand on Paul and given him a message to deliver to the people. Now, Paul has been tried. 
there's a man named Festus, and uh, he was a ruler, and they called Paul before Festus, and things didn't go real well in the hearing that he had before Festus. It looked like they were going to put him to death, and Paul makes the statement, I appeal to Caesar. I'm a Roman citizen, and so I'm asking for justice at the hands of the Roman court in Rome. And so they're going to send him to Caesar to be tried. And uh, Paul was a despised member of a group of people called Christians. And uh, the Apostle Paul is on the way to Rome to be tried. And he was tried. And he was executed when he got to Rome. Now, the matter that's under consideration when these four people met on the deck of that ship was, do they need to stay where they are at Fairhaven on the Isle of Crete, or do they need to sail about 50 miles on up and find a harbor at Phoenix and there anchor for the winter until they can get on to Rome. Now, they realized, they realized that there's better facilities for the ship 50 miles further up than it is at Fairhaven. And they look at all the things to be considered. It's a lovely day, the wind is blowing gently out of the south. The scriptures tell us these things. It's a very soft wind blowing. It seems as though the sky is clear and the sea is calm and it looks like a good day to sail. And so they're considering all this. But they all realize full well that it's winter coming on and they know that the weather can be unpredictable in the winter time and that there could a storm come at any time and so they begin to discuss what they're going to do are they going to sail on or are they going to stay now the final decision was uh, was with the captain julius he is gets the opinion of the ship owner, he gets the opinion of everybody that's present there, and uh, they make a decision, they're going to sail. So they weigh the anchor, and they start to sail out of the harbor at Fairhavens, and they notice that off in the horizon, there is an overcast condition that's coming in and uh, it's, they're just barely out of the harbor when the wind changes from the south and starts blowing from the northeast. Now, in the NIV, it says they had a storm that was brewing called a northeaster. You know, out here in the the Texas part of the country, we have in the wintertime, we have these storms that come and we call them northers. And uh, when we get a norther, you can know the wind's gonna come from the north and it's gonna get cold. Well, that's the way this northeaster was to them. They knew that the ship was probably in danger because the wind was starting to blow from the northeast. And it sure enough did. It said it became of hurricane strength. The ship was caught in this storm. They were unable to hold the course of the ship. And so they started trying to direct the ship in close to the islands for protection from the open sea. And then they were afraid they were going to run aground on the rocks and on the sandbars that were sticking out into the ocean there where they were. And so the ship 
was being blown and they couldn't control it and it looks like that the ship is going to be broken up. It says in the 26th chapter of the book of Acts that they decided they were going to have to lighten the ship. So everybody that was on board started throwing the cargo overboard. They were hauling grain and they dumped all the grain out into the ocean and lightened the load in the ship so the ship would float better and would have maybe better control of it. But uh, it didn't help much. The wind was just battering the ship. And it looked like, and though that says they took all the rigging, all the things that they used to, to load the ship, they took all the, 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 those facilities and threw them overboard. They're throwing everything overboard they can to try to preserve the ship. But uh, the storm raged, and in spite of all that could do, it says in the 26th chapter of Acts, that the storm raged for seven days. They saw no light. They saw no sunshine. It was dark and overcast. No doubt was raining. It was just a tempest that was beyond measure. And in Acts chapter 20, 27 verse 20, it says all hope was lost that they should be saved. It looks like the whole ship is going to be broken to pieces and they're all going to lose their lives. And so it was a dismal day, a black hour, we might say. You know, when men lose hope, folks, it's a bad thing. If people can keep their hope up, but if you don't have any hope, you know it's going to break up. You know it, you're going to be cast into the sea you're probably going to lose your life. And, and so despair comes on you. And it was destroying everything. It's like they were giving up to suicide. You know, you wonder, how does a man come to the place or a woman in their life when they say, I can't go on, and they go and they throw themselves out the back door of life and take their own life. You know, I read this week in the paper about how many of our young men who have been in the war in Iraq and been in the war in Afghanistan, and they've returned home and they have this stress syndrome and they're unable to contend with life and how many of these young men have committed suicide after they got back home it is such a dreadful thing that's taken place they've lost hope they they don't see anything but darkness out there for their future and they just think life isn't worth living and they want to give up. You know, that's what happened to Judas Iscariot after he betrayed Jesus. He got the 30 pieces of silver and he realized what he had done. And he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the temple and he gave it back to the Sanhedrin and he threw it in the floor and he went out and he hanged himself down by the potter's house where they take all those pot pieces of pottery that are less than usable and they break them out in the potter's field and Judas when they cut the rope that was holding him up in the tree that took his life he fell into the ground and his body burst open and, and what a dreadful sight because he had committed suicide and now the hope that these men on board this ship, they, uh, they looked at what they, where they were and how it was, and they, didn't, they just couldn't believe that they were going to make it through this. It is such an encouragement when you 
look at what Paul said to these people when he said, Sirs, be of good cheer. God has told me that nobody on board the ship is going to lose their life. That's a reason to be glad, folks. If God could come to you and say, hey, you don't have to worry about this. I'm taking care of it, and you have a home in heaven with me. And bless God, if you know Jesus Christ, you know what he said. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. We can hold on to our hope. And so here Paul is saying there's some life yet ahead of all of us. And uh, these people on board this stricken ship, they are soaked by the waves, the rain. They hadn't had anything to eat. They are full of fear and despair. And they think we're just waiting for the end. We're going to die out here. But it was just too wonderful to tell. When the Apostle Paul stood up and says, I believe God is going to do exactly what he told me he was going to do. I hope in your heart this morning that you can say, I believe God. He says, to as many as received him, to receive him, he gave to be power to become the sons of God. If you believe that, then you anchor your life in that faith that God is going to take care of you. Now, Paul stands up before them. And this preacher who had meant very little to any of these people on board the ship at the beginning of the voyage, he now becomes one of the focal characters of the story. He comes from the secret place of prayer. I don't know where Paul was when he prayed, but he says here, he said, that there stood by me this night an angel of God whose I am, and whom I serve, and God gave me a message to give to you. And so the Apostle Paul gets up from the place of prayer, and he steadies himself on that slippery, wet deck that he's standing on, and he shouts encouraging words. While the ship is plunging and diving, and the wind is shrieking in their ears, and while they just feel that death is just the next step away from them, Paul lifts his voice up and listen to what he says. Be of good cheer. I mean, here the storm is raging. The ship is about to break up. It looks like we're all going to be thrown out in the drink. And Paul says, be of good cheer. Well, as he stood there and said, be of good cheer. You know, he's a brave soul. He, uh, he is a benefactor of the faith. Be of good cheer. How does he utter those words like that? Where does, where the, how does he get off standing up in the middle of a storm like this when everybody is scared to death for their life and he comes out with something like this. It's not based on anything that's tangible. It's not because Paul is a skillful sailor and he knows exactly what they need to do to steady the ship and keep it under control. It's not because the Apostle Paul has any authority because he has none. The Roman officer that on board the ship, he's the one that has the authority. The ship is ready to sink. And because the storm is lulling, no. Because the skies are clearing, no. That's not the case, folks. It was dark, and there was lightning and thunder, and the wind is roaring. 
And Paul says, be of good cheer. Now just saying something like that doesn't remove any danger. It doesn't uh, cause the storm to lay down and be still again. It doesn't keep the ship from being broken. Paul says, don't be afraid. Be glad. Why? Because the angel of the Lord stood by me tonight and gave me this message for you. You know, Christ and his disciples were never afraid to look a storm in the face. When the paralyzed man was brought to Jesus by his four friends and they sit him down at the feet of Jesus and Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he got up and rolled up his bed, put it on his shoulder and started walking. The Lord wasn't afraid to face a storm like that. And the apostle Paul says, I've got a good word for you from the Lord. And I want to tell you, folks, we're living in a world today when we need a good word from the Lord. All of God's children need to live with an awareness that God is omnipotent and that God has promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. Then God is going to be there. And he said, I'll supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. And so the Apostle Paul stands up in what seems to be an, an inevitable disaster. And he says, you know, I belong to the Lord and God has told me that he's going to take care and I have asked him for your life. Paul had been praying that God would spare these people. And he said, and he assured me that he is going to save your life. It's going to be just like God told me it was going to be. And dear ones, listen. You can count on the promises of God. You don't have to worry if God has promised you I'm going to be with you, then you can bank on it. You can trust the Lord. Now, what's the outcome? Paul stands up and says, be of good cheer. God has told me that nobody's going to lose their life on this ship. You know. Is it worthwhile to have that kind of guy on board your ship? I want to tell you, it's worth everything to have those kind of people in the church. People that say, I'm not afraid. I know the Lord is going to provide and God is going to take care of us and God is going to see to it that the storm doesn't sweep us away. When Paul said, I believe God, he didn't just sit down and leave everybody standing there like that. No, that's not what he did. He insisted that everybody do, do all they could that was humanly possible. He tells his audience that he's talking to that day that they need to do something. And you know, real faith will cause us to take an action. If you really got faith in God, you don't just sit down on your blessed assurance and say, well, this is in God's hands and I don't have to do anything. You'll notice what Paul says to these people. He says, I want y'all to all get something to eat. They had eight days. And so the apostle Paul says, uh, I want y'all to realize that we need to, I pray that in verse number 34 it is, and Paul, while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all, say, besought them all to take meat, saying, this day is the 14th day 
that you have tarried and continued fasting and have taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and ate and gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them. Paul said, you guys are going to have to take care of your health. Here they were thinking they were getting ready to die. And Paul said, no, you're going to live. So you need to get up and, and eat something. And so the Apostle Paul, is uh, while the, the ship is floundering, the Apostle Paul holds the whole bunch together. You know, uh, the last person to leave the ship is who? The captain of the ship? He makes sure everybody else is on, is, is safely away, and then he leaves. And he's the last one to abandon the ship. Now, they were having a problem here in this instance. If you look at verse number 30, as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under the color as though they had cast the anchors out of the foreship, they were got the lifeboat out and they were letting it down. What they were going to do is they were going to get in this lifeboat and get out of there. And uh, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Said, you can't abandon the ship. You're going to have to stay here. And the soldiers cut the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. I bet when they cut the ro ropes off of that lifeboat and it fell into the sea and they're all standing there getting ready to get in thinking they're going to escape with their life, they must have thought, oh, this is so stupid that we've cut the lifeboat ropes and it fell away and now we don't have any way to get out of here. And Paul let them know, except you abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. And if you look at verse 33, and while the day was coming on, Paul said, I want you to take meat. You haven't ate anything in two weeks, and I want you to take care of your health. These the sailors had no thought that God was going to take care of them. And... Uh, the Apostle Paul speaks to the captain of the ship and he brought some hope and courage to these people who were in despair. I want you to know, Paul, folks, a man of faith is worth everything in the time of the storm. When you got people who have faith in God and they're willing to stake their life on it and I'm going to trust the Lord he said this is what he'll do and I believe he's going to do it. The Apostle Paul takes a stand and says, I believe God. He had courage. You know, fear is contagious. You get fear in your heart and you start scurrying around trying to <laughs> take care of old number one and First thing you know, it's rubbed off on everybody else and nobody is trying to help anybody. Everybody's looking after their own interest. And this is cowardice and fear has gripped the hearts of all these people. And Paul has to stand up and say, I believe God is going to do what he said he is going to do. I want you to know courage is catching too. Here somebody express his faith in God and Paul changed the lives of these men. Paul saved the whole situation. It says as you read starting in verse 39 it's about the ship is going to be wrecked. It is going to be broken in pieces. It says 
They had taken up the anchors and they committed themselves to the sea. They loosed the rudder and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward the shore. They were doing exactly what Paul told them. That's what God wants us to do. And falling into place where two, the two seas met, they ran aground and the forepart struck fast and the remain and the remainder and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the wave. The ship broke in pieces. And that they were thinking, well, all of these prisoners on board this ship that were taken to prison in Rome were gonna escape and they were gonna kill all the prisoners. And Paul says, No. Don't do that. And everybody that could swim, swam to shore, and those that couldn't swim, they found them aboard from the broken up ship. They found them something to float on, and they all escaped safely to the land, verse 44 says. <laughs> they made it to the shore. There was no panic. Everybody was saved, just like God said it was going to be. Paul put salvation in the hands of all of God's people. He said, I believe God. I believe God and it will be even as it was told to me. Dear ones, I would have you this morning to know you can believe God. God is going to see you and I, our church, our whole flock. He's going to see that this church is blessed and this church is used of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I remember when I had gone to my first full-time church and uh, we were torn by strife in the church. Had an enormous break in the fellowship. And the church had voted two families to be disciplined by removing them from the membership roles. And uh, it was an explosive situation. You know, when you're in your first church, and here I was, I think 24 years old. I didn't know anything about how to deal with a church problem. And uh, my main thought was I need to get out of here. <laughs> you know, I just thought that's exactly what I ought to do. I ought to get my goods and go back where I came from. And uh, I called my pastor and talked to him. He said, no, no. Now, you told me when you went over there a month ago that God had told you to go. I said, yes, sir. I thought God told me to go. He said, all right. God hadn't changed his mind. And you don't need to change your mind either. You need to just stay put and wait on the Lord because God's going to see through all of this stuff that you're having to wrestle with. So, I decided I was going to stay. <coughs> and I didn't know. You know, uh, you, you get up in a business meeting and you got to, I think we had eight deacons in the church and, and one of those deacons had uh, uh, said, you know, it looks like our church is going to dissolve and uh, said, I just want y'all to know that I'm willing to stay and, and serve the Lord no matter what happens. Well, that's what we needed, some, somebody to say, I'm committed. And you know, before it was all over, all eight of those men had stood up for the Lord that night and said, Church, we're going to stay here and we're going to work through these problems and we don't need to give up the ship. 
You know, I'm so grateful, folks. I don't know. That was the first church I'd ever been pastor of where I lived on the field and where I had responsibilities of overseeing the ministry of the Lord in that place. And I was so inexperienced that when these guys, you know, here I was 24 years old and I had some men that were deacons that were 60 and I thought they were ancient. <laughs> you know, and I can tell you, if, if you're 60, you're not ancient. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. But you know, I, those guys stood up for the Lord and God honored their stand and the church survived and you know, we uh, kind of got over that hump there and we decided we was going to have a revival. And so I called an old man named T.R. Bedford. Some of y'all may have remembered Brother Bedford. He was a missionary to the Indians out in Arizona. And Bedford drove a big old Chevrolet box truck that he carried clothes and and food and stuff like that out to the Indians every time he made a trip to Arizona. But Bedford had a tent. It's a tent bigger than the one that our church bought uh, when we bought the one that Manuel was using for the revivals. And so we asked Bedford to come to the church and have a tent revival. Now, this was in 1959. <coughs> And so, uh, tent, tent revivals was pretty well accepted, and we put the tent up, and we started having services. We put loudspeakers up, and you could hear that preaching and the singing all over the south end of the city of Crane. You know, uh, we even had a few people that complained that we were disturbing the peace. <laughs> and, uh, but the policeman said, don't worry about it. Maybe they'll get religion. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we scheduled the tent revival, and we went along there for a week. And the last Sunday of the first week of revival, we had two people come to know Jesus. We had a old boy named Carl Smith, and we had a guy named Macaulay. Both of these guys were into their 60s and had retired from Gulf Oil Corporation as pumpers out in the oil field. And both of these guys had a big chicken yard full of fighting roosters. Now, if you don't know nothing about cockfighting, I want to tell you that's a big business in Texas even yet today. And old Carl, he probably had a hundred game chickens fighting roosters. And uh, old Max, he had uh, probably nearly as many as Carl did. And every week they had a trailer that they had fixed so it would air could circulate through it and then take a whole load of fighting roosters and they would head to Louisiana. I don't know why they went to Louisiana, but that's where the cop fights were. And they would take all the roosters down there and they'd spend the weekend down there fighting roosters and uh, then they'd come back. But uh, those two guys were two guys that came to know Jesus at the end of the first week of that revival. When Max was baptized, his wife and his five children, four sons and a daughter, all came. I never saw such rejoicing in a family when their dad came to know Jesus. Carl Smith was a man who had three daughters. And Carl not only had a fighting rooster problem, but he he was an alcoholic as well. And when Carl walked down the aisle on that Sunday morning and made his decision to trust Jesus, 
his wife was named Cindy, and I've never seen a woman that was so thrilled that she just wept and she had hug him and she had weep and she had hug him again and his daughters were there and it was a glorious experience that these two men were saved. Well, we decided after the revival, after that Sunday morning service that maybe we didn't need to quit having a revival. Maybe we need to extend it another week. Now, folks, you think today, we have a revival and what do we, when do we have it? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We have a four-day revival. And if you were to try to say, well, we're going to have eight-day revival, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday again. Oh, some of our people would say, oh, well, I can't do that. We're so busy. Yeah, but I want you to know, we had had a week of revival, and we decided we was going to extend it another week. And so we had a 15-day revival in that little old church. And they fed the preacher, and the preacher and I visited, and we ended up, after the second week of revival, we'd had 17 people saved in the revival in a little town of about 2,500 people. And we had had 10 people that transferred their membership to the church. And the church, when we closed out the revival that Sunday, had 140 in attendance, and the church had never had an attendance like that. God sent a revival, and it was because somebody had the courage, our deacons in that church had the courage to say, I believe God. I believe God and I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to be here for God's church and I want to see that God's going to bless it. Could I close the service this morning by saying I believe the secret of having the power of God in a church, folks, is when we can say I believe God. I believe God is going to do what he said he'd do. And I believe God is going to bless us. I hope this morning you can say that. I believe God. This is God's church. This is God's business. We're God's people. And if we will say, I believe God, God's going to bless us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I read this story about the Apostle Paul. Truly, he was a great believer. Even when his life was threatened, when it seemed as though they were going to ship him off to Rome and he was going to be judged by Caesar, Paul still believed that God was in control. Dear Lord, I pray this morning you'd speak to the hearts of all of us that we would know that we can trust the Lord in the matters concerning His church. Lord, we pray that you might revive your work in the midst of the years. And this morning, if there's someone here that needs to trust in the Lord, I pray they will step out and say, I want Jesus as my Savior. I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that needs a church home, that they'll say, I believe this is where God wants me to be, and they'll come. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Give us courage to respond as we open the invitation and invite people to come to the Lord and to the church. We pray your will shall be done, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.